this lead off is focusing on Clara Zetkin and the women's work of the second international. And the structure of the introduction is as follows. First, I want to give some general context in which the work developed. Then I want to highlight four key features of the women's work. Thirdly, I want to uh, highlight the dynamic and some of the challenges, how the work developed over 20 years. And then lastly, I want to highlight the legacy of it in terms of the influence it had on the Bolshevik women and their work amongst women and the third international. But before I get started on all that, I think it, maybe we should just take a moment to discuss why it is even important to discuss this. And for me, there are three reasons. The first one is that this was the first mass movement of working class women, which at its height, just before the First World War, organized 175,000 women in Germany alone. It was a movement with a strong working class internationalist outlook, bringing together socialist women's movements from 15 countries. And it had an impact on Bolshevik women and played an important role in, uh, in, in, in uh, an important contribution in the Russian Revolution. The second one is that I think there are lessons for today. Though, even though at first some of the reading can look really dated, in many ways the approach that the, those socialist women took 100 years ago still informs our approach to work to liber women's liberation today. And equally so, we can learn from the mistakes they made and the challenges they faced. And a third important reason for me is that Marxism today is still under attack within the women's movement as being reductive, saying that only class matters, or that we're only focused on women as workers. And I'm thinking, for instance, in, uh, uh, at, uh, of the new book that Silvia Federici is bringing out. And on the other hand, Stalinism has hidden and distorted the real history of working class women's movement in the second and the early third international. And we should reclaim the real history. So to start with my structure, uh, to give some context to how this work first developed. I think it's really important to see the development of Zetkin, Tara Zetkin's thought in context. And that's not just the context of Marxist theory, how she based herself on Babel and Engels, but also the actual lived experience of the political situation in Germany. the rapid growth of the socialist women's movement in Germany within the context of the growth of the SPD in general, the friction within the party leadership, with the party leadership and with the trade union bureaucracy, first with the reformist uh, tendencies around Bernstein and then with the bureaucratization, especially after 1907. And then the difficult relationship with the uh, bourgeois feminist movement, in, movement which was also growing. So to give comrades some idea of dates, I put this PowerPoint up there <laughs> for people to just look at or something. <laughs> I think really the dates that stand out here is that the women's work starts really in earnest in 1891 when Zetkin becomes editor of uh, Gleichheit uh, Equality, the magazine that uh, the women's movement brought out. And that in the following years, that movement grows into a nation, you know, a broad movement that is able to organize national congresses and even international congresses, but all in the context of actually it's still being illegal for women to be politically active. And how the women's movement moves to the left of the, the, of the socialist movement plays a role in, uh, in fighting against imperialism and the First World War supports the Re Russian Revolution, and how most of the leading women involved in the women's work actually end up in the, in the communist parties. So to go on to four key features of the women's work. I think when you read Clara Zetkin's writings, you can see a tension between two tasks. On the one hand, the fight to make sure that an intervention into the women's movement is based on a class conscious intervention with a socialist program. On the other hand, the fight within the socialist movement about the importance of recruiting and developing women cater. And then in order to do this, the party has to pay attention to issues of importance to working class women. 
And Zetkin is fighting for this within the SPD, which in reality was a party that was a, a broad church. Um, they placed more importance on organizing the majority of the working class than they did on political clarity and cohesion. So a first key feature that she fights for from the very start is theoretical clarity. And this is in the context of people like La Salle, who call themselves explicitly anti-feminists, but also patriarchal influences uh, in, in most of the of most of the EC male EC members in the socialist movement. You got them on the one hand, you got the few women who are involved in the movement on the other hand, looking towards the bourgeois women's movement for answers. And Zetkin intervenes in this, basing herself on Engels, but also Babel's book, uh, and really highlighting the necessity to do away with capitalism. Really exposing that under a capitalist economic system, women will never achieve full, equal full equality. And the conclusion of that, of course, is that the socialist women's movement has to be in unity with the socialist movement as a whole to achieve a socialist transformation of society. She focuses on the fact that capitalism forces, for the first time, women to work outside of the home into workplaces. And she recognizes the double burden this places on women, but she also highlights it allows working class women to get organized to achieve economic independence, and that that has an impact on the consciousness of working class women as a whole. Second thing she really emphasizes is very strongly is that women, working class women do not have common cause with the bourgeois women's movement. Even if the demands of both movements look similar or sometimes are even the same. So for instance, the socialist women's movement was very actively involved in the suffrage movement the movement for voting rights. But they emphasize that for working class women, for voting rights are an assist to be, become politically active and to join the fight for economic democracy as well as political democracy. And that therefore the bourgeois women's movement cannot be trusted as allies because they want political rights, voting rights to protect their economic interests. And that point was highlighted by the fact that many bourgeois um, women's move, parts of the uh, bourgeois women's movement didn't call for universal suffrage, but called for suffrage based on property ownership. But Zetkin didn't just leave it at highlighting those contrasting or you know conflicting interests. She highlights that they are actually uh, rooted in a fundamentally contradictory understanding of the world. And that while the liberal bourgeois women's movements talk about a moral question and natural rights, that Marxists understand the material basis of women's oppression is rooted in class society. And you can see throughout the writing in Gleichheit, those theoretical points being re repeated and rehearsed again and again. I think a second key feature of the, uh, of, of the movement is the development of a program around women's liberation. So in 1896, at the Congress in Gotha, um, Zetkin makes a speech that is kind of the basis for the, the women's program that is then further developed over the next uh, 20 years. Where she makes a strong case to uh, take up the issue of civil rights for women. But around that time, there are debates in the Reichstag around the civil code, for instance. So around um, marriage law and so on and so forth. And the SPD representatives end up being the strongest, uh, the strongest voices to defend women's interests. And the issue of universal suffrage is strongly put forward as a, as a, as a demand that the, the, the international socialist movement should uniformly take up. But the women's movement also argues for protective labor legislation. So maternity leave, parental leave, equal pay for women, but also protective measures in the most exploitative sectors. So for instance, dom domestic workers who suffer from sexual harassment and so on, all of these issues are taken up in the program. Abolition of the putting out system in which women were forced to take work home. And all these things sound self-evident to us today, but actually at the time, both the trade union bureaucracy 
and the bourgeois women's movement argued against those type of measures. The bourgeois women's movement, because they saw legal equality as an abstract principle. The right wing of the workers movement, because they saw women as the weakest section of the working class who undermined the wages of better organized men. And in contrast, when you look at the program that is being put forward by the women uh, within the SPD, you get a sense of them actually being connected to working class women and the struggles they were facing both in the workplace and in their lives in general. And that links with the third key feature of the work I want to highlight, which is very consciously organized work amongst working class women. Everything they did at the aim to recruit and develop female cater for women to be active participants in the movement based on the principle of self-emancipation. So they start with organizing women in their workplaces. And to give an idea, in 1892, there were 6 million female workers in industry, but less than 5,000 of those were actually organized. By 1913, 230,000 are organized in trade unions. And the women's movement focuses on, focuses on active interventions and support of strikes of female workers. For instance, the 1896 seems to strike in Berlin where they helped to bring out over 10,000 seamstress, seamstresses, garment workers on strike. And the central demands are the abolition of the putting out system and replacing it with workshops and better and guaranteed pay. You can see how that links with the previous point I made around program. They build a political education network for socialist women. So by 1908, they have uh, clubs in 150 different towns and cities where over 4,000 women meet on a weekly basis to discuss politics. And they build structures to make sure that the women's work is led by women locally, regionally, nationally, and eventually internationally. And that demonstrations and events um, targeted at women are organized through those structures. And Glykeit, which is a magazine, is very much seen as a central organizer of this work. So it's used to highlight struggles in which working class women are involved and to inform women of their rights. Every issue has also strong political content to assist the education of women because they recognize women find it harder to attend meetings. It advertises good examples of agitation amongst working class women. And it communicates the initiatives that different areas are taking, meetings that are coming up, events and so on. A fourth key feature of the, of the work is uh, a strong international, internationalism. So the movement had from the start an international outlook. And you can see that both in terms of the articles that are being published in Gleichheit but also there's always been the aim to bring together socialist women uh, who are active in the Second International to build one truly international movement. And when you read the debates that uh, happened at the International Women's Conferences organized from 1907 onwards, you can see real clashes and you know, exchanges of ideas around program, um, how uh, different tactics around um, uh, uh, universal suffrage, uh, the attitude to take to the institution of the family and so on. And this actually made me think of how in the present uh, international uh, women's movement, there's also a growing internationalism. And I'm thinking of Veronica Gago's um, um, proposal for a feminist international, for instance, but the similarities and the differences we can maybe discuss in the discussion. I wanted to highlight those four key features because this approach as a whole led to a phenomenal increase in party membership uh, and working class women's activity. By 1913, the SPD had 175,000 women members out of a total membership of a million. And contrast this with, for instance, the French Socialist Party who didn't have, uh, who didn't have an orientation to working class women. 
who in 1914 had over 90,000 members. But only a few hundred of those were women. Okay, the third thing I wanted to highlight is the dynamic and the challenges of the work. Because over time, um, the positions that Zetkin uh, and Gleichheit also take shift. And actually, when Zetkin first arrives back in Germany after a period of exile, the first uh, attempt that the leading women make is to fully integrate women into the party. At that point, they are not thinking of building a specific women's movement. But their efforts fall flat. They find that women are not heard and represented. And Zetkin, Bader, Zietz reach the conclusion that women have to organize separately, not just because legally there's this law that, that doesn't allow women to organize, but also because of backward attitudes of male comrades. And unsurprisingly, this work is developed without much support from the party leadership. For instance, publishing Gleichheit doesn't get a penny from the party organization until 1903. And at that point, they'd already developed it into um, a, um, a circulation of over 11,000. The party also refuses to pay for a woman organizer. The first time they start paying somebody is in 1904. That's even though there were actually 450 women organizers active on a voluntary basis. And this is in a party that had over 30,000 officials by 1913, right? <laughs> you can also see a shift that when they start actually intervening in strikes and so on, the abstract positions that they had taken in uh, 1889 shift towards a more real understanding of working class lives of women. And that they become much more conscious and talk more about the consciousness of working class women. And I gave the example earlier of the whole debate around protective legislation. But you can also, you can see them also become more conservative on the issue of the family as an institution. Where in 1889, Zetkin is still very much propagating Engels' line of the family will be smashed. The working class family will fall apart under capitalism. They come up against the reality that Germany is a very patriarchal society and that those attitudes are alive and well in the party too. And especially in the early years when they mainly recruit the female partners of, of comrades, they make a retreat on this issue. From the late 90s onwards though, you see a moving away from a very economic focus of just organizing women in unions to a broader appreciation of women's oppression. And they start increasingly uh, highlighting through campaigns and so on issues such as sexual harassment in work, civil rights, free and quality public childcare, the challenging of gender stereotypes in, uh, in children. I think there's a link there with uh, the work uh, today. We've often discussed in our international how all these different aspects of women's oppression are interconnected and that each one of them has a radicalizing impact. Um, for instance, the, the present worldwide revolt or global movement has been driven by a reaction against gender violence uh, and by Me Too, to a large extent. And linked with this broadening out of, of an understanding of how oppression uh, uh, affects working class women, they also increase, um, are increasingly flexible about who they want to organize and reach. And then they move beyond the very, you know, traditional view of, of, of the working class in a factory to reach out to domestic workers, seamstresses, laundry workers, and working class housewives. So sectors of the working class that are traditionally aren't organized, but where they see there is a radical, they are affected by, by radicalization. And again, I think that's interesting for today in um, if you see how, you know, how women dominate precarious sectors, the informal economy. 
And it rang true for me, for instance, um, with the Debenham strike, which is happening here in Ireland, um, which is entirely female uh, workforce um, who have to actually put the first stamp down of going on. They're 300 days in, on, on strike now against the closing of their company, holding stock uh, ransom. These are low, low paid retail workers, but they are setting the tone of the type of resistance that will have to be built in the next period. I made the point at the start that they make this very sharp, clear theoretical distinction between their position and the bourgeois feminist movement's uh, position. But at the same time, they constantly interact and intervene into the movement. And I'd say they were so effective in, and annoying for the bourgeois to, in doing it that they were excluded explicitly from many structures. So they would go into those conferences and argue the socialist case for, uh, for universal suffrage, or for instance, oppose the idea of, uh, of birth strikes, which was being proposed as a way of fighting imperialism. And again, I think for any of us today involved in women's work, the idea of being a pain in the arse of liberals sounds familiar. <laughs> But for instance, specifically, the issue of the, the birth strike is very similar to the discussions that are happening today and the limitations we put point, point out of an exclusive focus on a household strike or a sex strike. So all of this is happening at the same time as there's these big ruptures opening up within the SPD as a whole. First, there is the fight against reformism. Comrades are probably familiar with uh, Luxembourg's uh, book, Reform or Revolution. Then after 1907, there is the fight against the bureaucratization of the SPD and opportunism. And in each of those struggles, Gleichheit and the women's movement becomes more associated with the left wing of the movement. Their program becomes clearer in, in terms of its revolutionary uh, content. They align themselves with Rosa Luxemburg against the trade union bureaucracy and uh, publish parts of her mass strike pamphlet are the first part of the movement to systematically argue against imperialism and war. And the 1905 revolution in Russia actually has an impact on all of this because it confirms for the leading women the revolutionary potential of the female working class. And by 1913, you can find in Gleichheit calls for an independent socialist movement against reformism. And as a result, the, the leadership of the party starts attacking the women's work at the same time as it is growing exponentially. So in the years after 1907, Gleichheit grows rapidly to a circulation of 125,000. The first International Women's Day in Berlin is held in 1911. Comrades may know that iconic poster of the woman in black holding the red flag with the slogan forward to uh, female suffrage. Poster was never used, it was banned by the empire, but they distributed two and a half million flyers and more than one million women came to that, came to that demonstration in Berlin alone. And in general, in the years before the war, you see a massive radicalization and increasing activity of working class women due to that double burden at work and at home and the threat of war, which really challenges the concept of the right that women are the weaker part of the movement, the more conservative part of the, of the workers' movement, you know? And internationally, the socialist women movement is also growing. The Bolsheviks start women's work from 1907 onwards. The Austrian socialist movement sets up independent women's structures in 1907 and by 1910 has 15,000 female members. But in the face of all this, the party leadership constantly attacks women's movement. So they try to dumb down the articles in Gleichheit saying, oh, they're too highfalutin, too difficult to understand for women. They're too, too political. And they argue for literally for <laughs> knitting patterns and recipes. <laughs> 
they also start endless maneuvers against in particular Zetkin to mar marginalize her in the movement. For instance, they make sure that the more, uh, the less experienced and, and quieter Louise Zietz is taken on as the female representative on the party EC. And use all kinds of gossip scandals about Zetkin's unconventional lifestyle. The trade union bureaucracy start their own competing magazine for women. And once women are legally allowed to be politically active, the bureaucracy uses that to say, well, we don't need separate structures anymore. So first they try to integrate the women's structures, then they postpone the conference. And by 1912, they uh, abolish the women's bureau. And all this means that by 1914, the left wing of the party is isolated, that Zetkin is isolated, but the legacy of the women's work is still shown in the activism of socialist women against the war and in the 1918 German revolution. And the first international socialist action against the war is organized by Zetkin in 1915. It brings together 30 women from eight countries and the key slogan is war on war. There's limitations to how it presents a socialist position. Uh, Lenin famously criticized it, but it actually had a significant impact. On the basis of that call, 15,000 women organized a demonstration in Berlin against the war. It also lands Zetkin in, in prison, which I guess is a backhanded compliment that the, the propaganda uh, caught uh, with the working class. And there are many examples of how socialist women used um, the cover of knitting circles or even the food queues to organize anti-war activities um, um, during the war. The last part of my leader was gonna have to be very short. I'm, I'm conscious of time. I want to just touch on a few points of legacy of the impact that this had on, on Bolshevik women's work uh, uh, amongst women and on the Third International. People like Kolontai, Armand and Krupskaya were all actively involved in the Second International's women's structures. And like Zetkin, they were very impacted by the role women played in the 1905 revolution. And after that, they start uh, arguing within the Bolshevik party to organize work amongst women in factories and neighborhoods. They start reading circles, they organize around the magazine. You can see how their method of approach is influenced by what was done in Germany. Obviously in the context of Russia, the work is much more difficult in illegal circumstances at the time. But in 1914, they once again uh, start uh, publishing a regular magazine and they built a female cater that, cater that is rooted in the neighborhoods and the factories. Districts like Viborg and textile factories that would prove to be very important in 1917. And they also play a key role in organizing uh, laundry workers, domestic workers, again, those sectors of, 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 of workers that traditionally aren't organized. I'm sure comrades know that women started the February revolution in 1917, going from factory to factory and bringing out, out 900,000 workers on strike on the first day. But all through 1917, there are many examples of strikes of laundry workers, domestic workers, mass demonstrations of soldiers' wives. And there's an anecdote that to me really highlights the, the standing that Bolshevik women had amongst the working class. In July, 1917, Alexandra Kolontai gets arrested. But within an hour, thousands of domestic workers organize themselves and blockade the police station to demand her uh, release. If you think about, these are some of the most isolated workers and just how quickly they came to the aid of somebody, somebody they saw as being on their side, an organizer for their class. It's, it's quite impressive. And of course, this focus on fighting for women's liberation and making sure that women were active, an active, active part of the revolution continued after the revolution. Soviet state had the most progressive legislation in the world, 
for legal equality was only seen as the very first step to uh, fight oppression. There's the many measures that the Soviet government brought in to bring household drudgery from the private into the public sphere. But one aspect of their work that actually deserves um, more attention is how they organized women to play an active part in the revolution through a program of delegate meetings and internships. And this is a mass program. It reaches 10, 10 million women participate in it in the first 10 years after the revolution. And this also links with the work in the East of the setting up of women's clubs and so on um, that, uh, that Zetkin herself uh, writes about in uh, 1925, 1926. I'm conscious I'm over time, so I'm just going to finish uh, uh, the last few points around Zetkin. Uh, Zetkin herself in 1919 helps to form the, the German Communist Party. By 1920, is tasked by Lenin to set up the women's work of the Third International in the same vein as uh, the experiences I described. But by 1924, she has significant differences over tactics in Germany and so on. She's sidelined. And she's sent to the Caucasus um, and is also very ill and going blind. Her last public appearance is a speech in the Reichstag in 1932. It's an hour long searing indictment of how bad the Nazis are for the working class. She's saying this to a room full of Nazis like. <laughs> but it's a measure of a woman who did dedicated her life to working class struggle to assisting working class women to play a full role in the socialist movement. And for who throughout her life remained committed to the revolutionary overthrow of the rotten system that is capitalism.